What's up, everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this Indie Explained, we're looking at Censor, following Enid, a film censor who views a strangely familiar horror movie and sets out to solve the past mystery of her sister's disappearance, embarking on a quest that dissolves the line between fiction and reality. I was really looking forward to this one, as it seemed to be a throwback to 80s horror in a creative, more cerebral kind of way. A major aspect to the movie is its setting in the UK during the times of the so-called video nasties. Back then, many now classic horror movies were considered to be potentially dangerous for public consumption and thusly were either heavily censored or outright banned in the UK, all with the intent of keeping the public safe from these salacious films. Sure, it's arguable that some of the entries were certainly pushing the envelope of violence, but in the many years since then, most if not all of them have been released uncut. Involving this aspect is the most compelling to me of censor, as we firsthand experience Ina's journey, tasked with censoring these movies, and she takes her job really seriously, truly believing that she's protecting society in a way. And even as she digs further into the nasties, she becomes absorbed in a way into the movies themselves, which is all really an interpretation of her breaking with reality, though there's still the main mystery of what happened with her sister. So let's dive into the neon-lit, blood-soaked world of Censor, breaking down the story, including Enid's past and the full story involving her sister's fate, as well as explaining the reality-shattering ending and what it means. A girl bathed in red stands facing away. She turns back hearing a ghoulish sound and starts bawling. There's more growling and she's dragged away screaming bloody murder. Our no-nonsense censor Enid pauses the tape, rewinding it and playing the moment again. At this time in history, as we mentioned, in particular in England, many horror films were severely cut or outright banned, the so-called video nasties. Enid certainly seems to err on the side of caution here, complaining that the eye-gouging moment is too realistic and the movie will require at least eight 18 more cuts to be approved. While on the flip side, this other guy Sanderson appears much more lax and even defensive, calling the gore art as it has a kind of heightened reality to it all. Ultimately, she puts her foot down. We can't make mistakes, we're cutting it. This shows us just how seriously Ina takes her job. Really, as I said, feeling like she's protecting society in a way, shielding them from this gratuitous violence. We come to understand why she's so serious, hearing news on the radio that correlates a rise in people watching violent films and deadly crimes, calling the film's presence corrupting, turning their viewers into almost addicts, needing stronger and stronger films to get the same kind of high. They have a heated debate about another movie, Enid finding a violent moment dangerous, while others feel that it's no big deal on account of it looking so fake. Another censor, Anne, and Enid continue to raise their concerns. What if something like this got into the hands of the children? Well, somebody think of the children. Working late into the night, she's the last to leave the office, the overheads clicking off behind her. Among some alleyways, she sees a lady and calls out to her. When she turns to face her, Enid apologizes, saying that she mistook her for someone else. She seems to live a mostly solitary life, sitting quietly at home, poring over a crossword puzzle, until her mom calls, reminding her of dinner that evening. Things are pretty tense and awkward between them. We see what Enid is reading over, a death certificate. Who for exactly isn't made clear yet, but it's her younger sister Nina, who has been missing for many years. Her parents are hoping this will give them some kind of closure, rather than waiting for a happy ending that may never come. Enid is perturbed, asking, oh, so they've decided she's dead? According to her, there's no way she was dead as she was with her that day in the forest too. But they point out they've already been down this road and Enid has never given them a full story of what happened. She still refuses to believe that she's gone. If she was taken away, they're still out there. She starts clicking her fingers in a nervous tick, her dad pointing it out. June explains that they're not blaming her but doing what's best, the right decision for all of us as a family. They try to change the subject to her work, asking if she's seen anything to recommend. But she's hard-nosed as always saying that this isn't entertainment. What she's doing is protecting people. She later digs out some childhood photos of her and Nina, also including an article from the past about a seven-year-old gone missing in the Chorley Forest. She's momentarily there in the forest and then wakes up, seeing a worrisome headline on a paper about crime increasing due to the abundance of video nasties. Oh no, Enid, they're all depending on you. Society is crumbling. She sits with Anne to watch a new movie called Extreme Coda. It opens immediately on a man attacking a girl, appearing quite disturbing, but Enid is stoic and unfazed as always. Anne even confronts her about this, but she just shrugs that she's focused on getting it right, 
not thinking about anything else. And it seems that the increase in violence has drawn a spotlight on them in a surprising way. Their boss, Frazier, asks if they remember passing a movie called Deranged. Sanderson doesn't, but of course, Enid does. Well, it features a sequence where someone's face was eaten, and a local man was just arrested for killing his wife and eating her face, as well as shooting his two kids. Journalists are already making a connection to the movie, Sanderson asking if they're trying to blame them. It seems so, as the journalist knows they approved it, but they're confused. It's no worse than anything else that they've passed. Yet the damage has already been done, the man being dubbed the Amnesia Killer, as he claims to not remember anything about the killings. Frazier warns in the future to check with him before approval, and if ever in doubt, just outright reject it. The story plays on the news, including the link to Derange, and they interview a woman who heard what happened, wondering if the world has gone mad. There's immediate fallout for Enid, getting barraged with angry phone calls given her grief, and telling her that she should be ashamed. She remembers back to that day as a kid, her dad asking where she is, and June crying, no, no! The spotlight only focuses more on Enid, an article considering if censors are to blame. As a result, there's a bunch of hungry journalists waiting outside the office. She overhears the others gossiping about her, and the face eating scene in question. Even Little Miss Perfect thought it was funny. She bursts in, everyone going quiet, Sanderson then offering a bad luck, huh? She hears herself telling her sister to spin, one, two, three, and Nina does as instructed. She then meets sleazy producer Doug Smart, and he gets a little fresh, suggesting that he could get her work on the big screen. She shoots back that she's not sure if she wants to get raped and cut to pieces on camera. Boom, shut down. He instead asks if she'd be interested in watching a film from the archive of director Frederick North. It's generic title, Don't Go in the Church. Enid joking, there won't be many places left to go soon. It opens on two young girls. One wants to go back, but the other keeps pushing her deeper into the woods. The lead girl decides to play a game, whispering in her ear as they come upon a ratty old house. Summon my shadow and spin, she orders, causing Enid to get noticeably uncomfortable, as this scene seems strikingly similar to what she was seeing in her flashes. This is overtly illustrated by the other girl being replaced by her redheaded sister for a moment. She tells her to go in the house, first psyching herself up before slowly approaching the open door. Enid's breath starts to get shaky, the movie kind of morphing together with her own memory. The other girl grabs an axe, following after. The blonde girl screams, and she starts chopping her up, Enid getting quite flustered, in contrast to her usual unflappable demeanor. She keeps going, really chopping her up good, Enid starting back up with her nervous tick and holding back tears. The girl emerges, wielding the axe, covered in blood, then suddenly seeing a big burly dude there. She's back to running in the woods, and clearly overwhelmed, Enid rushes to the toilet, looking quite on edge, really starting to appear that there's something Enid has suppressed of what happened to her sister, and it's beginning to spill out more and more, in particular thanks to this movie. Her colleague Perkins checks in on her, especially after seeing her freaking out in the screening. She mulls over the amnesiac killer, wondering how he wouldn't remember what happened, and Perkins considers that it's possible to be just basic trauma. The brain shuts it out. People construct stories to cope, saying you'd be surprised what a brain can edit out if it can't handle the truth. Hmm. Well, that sounds exactly like what Enid is going through here. I'm already suspicious that she actually killed her sister as a kid, and as Perkins said, edited out because she couldn't handle what she did. Blocked it out completely, at least until now. She almost brings out the strange movie to her mom, but stops herself, shrugging it off as nothing. Her having seen the news, June tries to give her a pep talk to not let all that get to you. She gets snippy with her and apologizes for being tired. June tries to convince her that she can't be responsible for everyone. It's just a job after all. She grumbles, I suppose so, but isn't going to let this go, digging through an old diary and dozes off, static blaring on the TV. She's awoken to the sound of heavy breathing, cradling a piece of fabric and ventures downstairs. Things are now bathed in purple and blue light, much more stylized than the drab appearance of things up to this point, feeling as though the movies she's been watching are kind of starting to take over or infiltrate her real world. This becomes much more clear when the static on the TV gives way to a dark forest, the wind chime too bathed in red. Enid calls out to her sister, apparently trapped in the gross old house, and a man emerges from between the trees. She looks to her hand, clutching a red clump of hair to her confusion, 
along with a note, don't go in the church. And the note is even signed from Frederick as well, showing us how the fictional and real world are beginning to blend, further solidified when Enid enters another room. There's anguish, moaning, and crying, and she comes across her mom turned away, who then screams, it's all your fault. Enid begins to believe that there is a connection with the filmmaker and Nina, asking for help with the company's archives. But without a list of his films, this could take at least a week. Stupid olden days, now everything is just a Google away. She happens upon on a storefront with a big poster for the beast man that looks just like the guy from the movie. She tells the clerk she's in search of some unusual films from Frederick North, hoping that he has some contraband under the counter. He's not buying it, telling her that a girl like her doesn't watch that kind of trash. She calls his bluff, detailing her favorite, Stationary Massacre, including a moment where someone gets stabbed in the eye with a compass, as well as someone's guts falling out and getting stapled back together, blithely proclaiming it to be a masterpiece. Bloody hell, he moans. He just just being careful, as so many places are getting shut down nowadays and retrieves something from a back closet wrapped in paper. He tempers her expectations, it's a ropey copy, and someone taped over the end, seeing that it's called Asunder. She pops it on and is immediately entranced by the red-haired actress. She rewinds the moment a few times and considers, could it actually be? Her sister all grown up and now an actress in a horror movie, and she actually does look strikingly similar to Enid as well. She sees that her name is Alice Lee and fast forwards to a scene of her screaming, accompanied by a chainsaw sound, which, you know, doesn't bode well for her, causing Enid to again get upset and immediately shuts off the tape. She brings up what she found to her parents, informing them she might have after all this time figured out where she is. Dad groans dismissively, her asserting that it's different this time, and admits that it's mad but has a strong feeling that it's her. She shows them the tape, asking them to focus on the face and her eyes. George stays at odds. They've been over this. It's never her. But she pleads. It looks just like the police mock-up. They get upset, bringing up that this is why they wanted to declare her dead, because Enid keeps going off and dredging up old wounds, going nuts like the day you went off on her, he accuses. Later, she's passed out at home with pictures. We pass over her to a red light and emerge in the forest, still red. Nina is there and does her spins, young Enid watching from afar. She then changes into Alice, who smiles warmly. A spooky figure emerges in shadow behind her, causing Enid to grow frightened. She turns back to the man and purposefully walks up the stairs right up to him and he snatches her away. She shouts, no, Nina, running after and enters this smoky abode, overwhelmed by a white light. She is suddenly at work, the red light still following her now. She sneaks into the archives and finds a copy of Don't Go Into the Church, jotting down the address marked on the outside canister. Following this, she tracks down the house belonging to the skeezy producer, Doug, who answers the door with a crowbar, blaming that people don't like his films have been bothering him in particular lately. She instantly recognizes the interior from a scene in Extreme Coda, Doug boasting that he won some awards in America for that one. She shows him a picture of Alice, asking if they look similar, and he agrees that they do, him wondering why it was that Enid looked so familiar to him. She presses him for info on the director, Frederick, who he deems a provocateur and misunderstood genius. In fact, it was Frederick that pressed her to view the movie, saying that he wanted a woman's eye on the film. He playfully asks if she's not enjoying her scotch, and she gulps the whole thing down in one drink. He mentions they're shooting a sequel to Church, at a location right by where they did the original. It turns out that this is to be Alice's last film, dismissing that she's come to the end of her shelf life. Worried what this means, she asks what they're going to do, abduct her? And he gets frisky out of nowhere, putting his arms all over her. They start tussling, and she gets loose, knocking him back on the table, sending the award right through the back of his head and out of his mouth. He sputters up blood until he croaks to death. Oh, whoops. Enid cracks her shoulders, trying to regain her composure, and calmly thanks him for the whiskey, saying, I'll see myself out. Seeming like she's really not comprehending what just went down here. You killed that guy, Enid, even if she doesn't get it. The ghost of Doug haunts her, receiving a call where he rants at her about deserving to get sliced up. The evil is contagious, and it's all your fault. Everything you touch turns to shit, he says, hearing distant screams emanating from the TV. Her mental state continues to deteriorate, sleepwalking through the office, things feeling quite off. Voices begging for help fill her consciousness. She busts in on Sanderson and Anne, watching a movie with Beastman and Alice, her saying nothing. Sanderson cuts the silence with, uh, we are in a viewing here, Enid appearing completely out of it. Someone's losing the plot, he snarks. She returns to the archives, not minding Valerie's pleas, and grabs a file that includes the new filming location. Valerie attempts to snatch the file back, but Enid assures her everything is gonna be okay. Yeah. If you say so, Enid. Shockingly, Sanderson has news that the amnesiac killer didn't even watch the movie Deranged that was being blamed for 
the killings after all. So maybe he was just inherently bad and it wasn't inspired by horror flicks whatsoever. Throngs of reporters wait outside and she shouts for them to get back, pushing her way through the bodies. Another movie on the TV is interrupted by a forest. And this time we actually enter into the shot as though we are ourselves entering into the movie, which aligns with Edith's current state. She drives through the woods with a map to find the filming location. She arrives at a dinky trailer with the light on, considering what to do. She cautiously gets out of the car, stopped by a distant scream from the darkness. A woman spots her from inside, and already thinking she might have to kill this lady, grabs a rock. When she comes out, Enid innocently asks if this is the film shoot with Alice Lee, and after puffing on a cig, she tells her only that she's late, thinking that she's another actor in the movie. Enid doesn't understand, as Debbie extends her hand in greeting. I'll be doing your makeup, she tells her, but notes that she looks nothing like her picture. Well, at least you showed up. Apparently, many of the cast never did show, and production has been all over the place, dragging her inside to get ready. Probably all a result of this bad press they've been getting lately. She's fitted into a white dress, and Enid spots a newspaper with her on the cover from the video store. The headline, censor with a bad video nasty habit, and she pushes the paper away. Another guy knocks on the door to hurry up as Frederick is getting impatient, Frederick being the director of the church movie and all that, who she's been looking for this entire time. Plus, there's no sign of the producer, which Debbie definitely finds weird. Doug, she says, would never miss a gory murder scene. Yeah, because he's dead and Enid killed him. She's doused by Debbie in some fake blood and asks what it is that they have planned for Alice Lee. She doesn't know what she means snapping a Polaroid. Enid stomps off through the trees, looking quite scared of what she's gotten herself into. Also make sure to note the change and aspect ratio from up to this point. She hears a voice saying, I've been waiting for you, finally meeting the infamous Frederick, directing her to step into the light and hurry up. He stays mysterious and out of sight, calling her guarded, assuming that it comes from a place of fear. She asks about the story that inspired the little girls in the church, and he steps into view, sniffing it was inspired by a true story. Divulging all of his ideas are drawn from real life, meaning that he was actually inspired by the original killing in the first place. She refuses to believe this, crying that isn't what happened. He tells her people think he creates horror, but he doesn't. It's already out there, in all of us. It's in you. No, it's not, she screams back. He continues prodding her to access her darkest impulses until he loses his patience, commanding her to commit. Take control of your own story, he orders. She's still not willing to, him then dismissing her to piss off. She pleads that she just wants her little sister back, and that angle is enough for him to work with. He continues breaking her down, telling her there's something rotten within her, and to let it out, stop fighting it, which does appear to be directly speaking to Enid, but is in fact all about setting the scene that he's filming. He then asks her to enter her story, getting right up in her face, and there's a sudden real change. As we now truly move into Enid's own movie, a kind of redo of that moment with her sister as children that has defined her so much. She's back at the Beast Man's house and picks up an axe. She heaves with determination, entering inside. Weirdly, Beast Man appears, calling her his love and gives her a big hug. He says that he's been waiting for her a long time and she's always been in his heart. She tentatively puts an arm around him, then refuses to accept this rosy version of things and lifts the axe into the air. He grabs Alice by the hair, reiterating there's something rotten and twisted inside of her and to let it out. You know you are evil, he sneers. Sort of proving his point, she goes at him with the axe, stammering, that's not in the script. Alice cries, Charles, and he tumbles back into a TV, causing it to explode in a fire of sparks. Out of his axe wound, a mouth emerges, declaring, I am whore, and she keeps slashing relentlessly at him. The aspect ratio that had been more square fixes back to that of the real world, now understanding how far her delusion has evolved at this point, and effectively her exiting the movie and seeing the real perspective in the real world. Frederick storms in, asking what the hell she's doing. The sound guy blowing chunks at the grisly scene. She screams, this is all your fault, and cleanly decapitates him in one fell swoop. Oh boy. This showdown is a complete synthesis of the movie's influencing her combined with her own real history. The violence is a bit goofy on purpose is all I'm saying. Caught some definite Evil Dead 2 homages there. She chases down Alice, still convinced of her delusion that she is her grown up sister, while Alice is torn up, saying that she killed her friend Charles, obviously the Beast Man's actor's real name. Enid tries to convince her of her fantasy. You're my sister, I would never hurt you. Alice screams, I already have a sister and it's not you. Her not understanding what the hell is going on here. Enid keeps whimpering, you have to be her, falling to the ground in tears. She is still literally unable to accept anything otherwise, still believing she could have never killed her sister and been rotten as continuously accused. The aspect ratio gets wobbly and static takes over and she redoes her own version of things, rewinding on a remote to a better ending 
ending the edit in her brain. An angelic looking Alice emerges from a wholly blinding light. She smiles. You came back to save me. Yes, I did, she says dreamily. She holds out her hand, telling her to come home. It's suddenly daytime, and they're holding hands, laughing and running together. Reunited, and it feels so good. The overly positive outcome spreads further. On the radio, hearing that thanks to dealing with the video nasties, all crime rate has dropped to zero. The streets of Britain are safe at last. The two cheerily driving through a rainbow, but then there's a quick flash of real life. Alice looking terrified and screaming out the window. They come to Enid's parents' house, escorting Alice out into the street. Her parents emerge and wave to them. It's all so perfect. The family back together after all those years of trauma. Alice excitedly runs toward them. Enid mouthing, found her, and the parents give her a long overdue warm embrace. Enid feeling like she did it after all. Then there's another distortion. Save me, Alice yells. The parents look terrified and confused. Enid slowly walks proudly towards them, Alice still screaming. She turns back and smiles and can't help but laugh. Things turning a-okay in the end, as far as she's aware at least. The ending and how things go down make it perfectly clear what happened. Enid must have killed her sister as a child, and as is brought up at one point, it's amazing what the brain is able to edit or really censor in a sense to protect it. That's exactly what Enid is going through here. She has stuffed deep down what she did to the extent of really forgetting all the details completely. It's by watching that movie that kind of triggers her memory of the past. But as we saw, when confronted with the truth, Alice not being her sister, she still is unable or unwilling to accept this, hence the whole rewinding thing in the woods. And the final super over-the-top fantasy positive outcome. She has once again censored her own memories because she can't deal with killing Nina. Something I noticed was this entire moment is an exact recreation of another tape she picked up back at the store, showing us just how much all of this has started to really influence Enid subconsciously. Also, it seems to be the point that Enid was so adamant about preventing the public from seeing these nasties that she instead ended up being influenced by their content. Also, the director claimed to her that she has evil within her and is rotten at the core. She continuously rebukes this, but it appears for all intents and purposes that this actually is the case. There is something deeply wrong with her at her core, because she winds up killing even more people to avoid reality, and in the end has completely succumbed to her own mental fantasy. Now a hero in her own mind. Well, that wraps it up for this ending explained on Censor. While I did particularly enjoy its use of the real life video nasties aspect, I could have used a lot more digging in deeper into this, and indeed many aspects of the story overall. It just felt a bit simple, I would say, but I still did enjoy the story it told in the end. Damn those horror movies always turning people into crazed killers. And don't forget before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you guys think of Censor and its ending? What do you think really happened in the end with Enid? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.